Good morning. Welcome to Mesa View United Methodist Church. Welcome to everyone who is worshiping here in person. Welcome to all of those viewing us online, either live right now or in the near future. We're happy that you're joining us today. So let us stand as we're able and praise and sing our first song, Let It Rise. seated and I want to welcome you today to Mesa View United Methodist Church. Um, as we gather today, just a quick reminder 
that we will be doing um, a sort of um, hybrid shared conversation today, and um, we want to be a, and we want to be a church that knows and loves God and our neighbor through relationship, services, and witness, as we say every Sunday morning. And so the conversation that we're going to be having is about how we can go forth to encounter our uh, encounter God and our neighbor in the world. So we'll get started with that in just a few minutes in the sermon. I want to welcome everyone here today who's joining us both in person and online. Um, and I want to thank everybody who's watching online for their patience because we had some sound issues um, and some technical issues at 8.30. So thank you for waiting a couple of hours to join the later service. As we get ready for that conversation, you can do so by um, doing a couple of things. First of all, if you are watching online, go ahead and check in, as you always do, by hitting like on Facebook or, or YouTube. Uh, but also, you can get ready by, on a separate tablet or laptop or device, go to minty.com, and that's how we will be collecting responses as we have this conversation. And you spell that M-E-N-T-I, I as an iceberg, dot com, M-E-N-T-I dot com. And when it's time, um, it, I'll give you a code. Uh, you'll um, just enter the code to start the right survey. Uh, but for now, let's continue this day of worship and kick things off uh, with some more uh, beautiful music. And so, um, Rick and Christy, you share with us your next song. Come set you rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very soul. Holy Spirit, come and let us now. We are your church. We need your power. We seek your kingdom. We hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our life, for your our joy and pride, to see the captive heart release, the hurt, the sick. and Rick. Um, 
and uh, as, as I was monitoring the Facebook uh, stream, um, and uh, sent a message to thank you guys for your music ministry as well. So y'all are quite talented, and we're lucky um, to have you, so thank you. Uh, we come to a time of prayers and joys and concerns today. Um, if you're watching online, you can share those concerns either at care at mesaviewumc.org or by um, leaving the prayer concerns in the uh, comment section of whichever uh, streaming service you're watching us with, Facebook or YouTube. If, um, if it is something you share on there, make sure it's nothing that's private, and please be sure to use only first names. Um, but for those here in the room, are there joys or concerns today? Yes, Mary. So first of all, welcome home, Mary. I'm glad you're here. I saw your Green Bay sweatshirt, and I thought, oh, Mary's been to uh, Wisconsin, all right. And so <laughs> that, that's an old one. All right, that's cool. Oh, wow, that's commitment. You're missing the Packers game right now. Um, and, and Packers fans and Cowboys fans, I know that that's hard for both teams to miss the games. And so um, we're, we're glad you're here today. Um, other joys or concerns? Yes, so we want to lift up Diana and all small business owners right now um, who, I, um, it, it's an incredibly difficult time for small business owners right now. And um, we should be supporting them where we can and uh, praying for them daily because uh, it's, it's hard. We, I, I agree. We will lift that up. Other joys or concerns today? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, we look to you in times such as this because we need the goodness that comes from you. Uh, here we are in the midst of frightening times when wo words of division and anger and war soar to the heavens. And that anger seems to be the way to treat others and to respond to difficulty. And so be with us, Lord, and help us chart a different path. We don't want to live in these hideous ways. We seek your peace and healing love. We pray that you would help us to love our neighbor, to love those around us, to look after one another in this time of pandemic and to do right by one another, to be selfless in our care for one another. We pray that you would help us to love our neighbor even if we don't vote like our neighbor. Help us and remind us that we are one community. Our hearts are filled with concern for our families and friends and those in far off lands who face great difficulties and illness and mourning. We have shared the names of those for whom we seek prayers, knowing that you hear our cries and you respond in love. And so Lord, whether we have spoken their names or we have lifted them up or typed them on a screen, um, or if we've just lifted them up in our own heart, we bring before you the names of dear ones in our hearts. Be with all of us, O oh Lord, and heal our wounds. Direct our lives and pathways of peace. Because it's these things that we offer in Jesus' name as we pray, as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, as we worship today, um, we're here to celebrate all that God has done through our church. Um, and as we read our first scripture, we see that Paul too is able to look back with joy on, on the way that God has traveled with him and journeyed with him all over the world and into different places in life. And so here is our first passage um, from the book of Philippians. Here Paul writes, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of, of going hungry, of having plenty 
and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was, the, it was kind of you to share my distress. You Philippians indeed know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs more than once. Our section, second reading um, is also a story about Paul, uh, not Paul who wrote it. And in Acts, Paul arrives at a sort of marketplace of ideas when he comes to Athens. And, and he is surrounded by um, pagan gods and idols. And, and he does something very unexpected because instead of denouncing them, he uses uh, carefully directed words to the people to help direct them to the one true God. And so here are Acts, here is Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace, every day with those who happened to be there. Also some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and said, uh, and asked him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time uh, in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things, from one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth. And he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God, perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked these times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. When they heard all of the resurrect, when they heard all of this, at that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and, and became believers, including Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And this is the good news of Jesus Christ. Praise be, thanks be to God. So as I uh, prepared for um, today, I realized I had to start by challenging something of an assumption. Um, that our culture, I think, very often takes for granted, and that is the, um, the sort of the, the ideal of the self-made person, the self-made man or woman, uh, and this idea that, that, you know, all that we accomplish we do by pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, um, which those are good values, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't aspire to these things. Um, it, the, the world that we live in is, is created by people who were in, innovators, um, individuals who saw things that um, others did not and they, and they willed them into existence. But 
Uh, and, and indeed, you know, I, I grew up like a lot of you thinking about Edison and the Wright brothers and Henry Ford and other people who we live in this world that they, that they created. Uh, but what I think is interesting is when you look at how those innovations and those individuals' uh, part in the story really played out. Um, if any of you all have ever re read the recent biography of the, of the Wright brothers, it's one such example. Now, the Wright brothers lived in an era where lots of people were trying to be the masters of flight. And we should give them credit. They were the ones who pulled it off. Uh, but they pulled it off, and they accomplished it on the um, uh, out near Kitty Hawk and in the outer area of North Carolina because they were learning along the way from the failures and occasionally the successes of others. They were able to innovate because of the insights that they were getting from others along the way. And a lot of the competition on this was very cutthroat, but sometimes it was very collaborative as different uh, hopeful aviators learned from one another. Even though, even so, their accomplishment was to build the right flyer, which um, took off from Kill Devil Hill, and it flew a magnificent 120 feet in about 12 seconds. Now, they made some improvements on their flyer as they went along. Um, they, they, they made some better and better airplanes as they went along. But the world of aviation that we, lived in, that we live in today, it may have started with them, but, but we experience it on the backs of thousands and thousands of others. Um, we experience it when we step into a jumbo jet. And you can get on a 747 today and first of all realize that the wingspan of that aircraft is longer than the flight that the Wright brothers took. And you can go anywhere you, you can take off and go anywhere you want to in the world. But the reason we get to do that is not just because of the Wright Brothers' innovation. Uh, a 747 or any jet, uh, any jet plane is the creation of thousands and thousands and thousands of engineers and experts and pilots who have done trial and error and have innovated along the way. It was collaborative. Same thing I always think of the moon landing. Uh, the moon landing was the product of tens of thousands of engineers and experts. The real magic of flight came from the experience and failures and problem solving of lots of teams. See, one of the things that we're learning in our time is that none of us live in isolation. No matter what you do um, in life, it, it, it's not something that happens in isolation. The greatest achievements aren't something that comes from a single vision, it comes from a shared vision, from something where lots of minds come together in collaboration. And so as we get ready to begin this visioning process for our church, I'm hoping the same dynamic happens here. For the last several weeks, you've heard me talk a little bit about vision, but if it's just from me, then what we're gonna have is the church equivalent of the right flyer, where maybe it'll fly for 120 feet or so, but we want a jumbo jet. We want something that um, connects people and does substantial things in our, in our community and culture. Churches usually don't do this well. We usually do visioning in isolation. We think, what do we want for our own internal goals? Where, you know, what do we want with our own internal programs and, and ministries? But churches, as we've talked about, are not in isolation. We exist as part of a community. We're part of a greater whole. We're united, though, by one goal, by one tradition, and so church is this place where we take the tradition that we've been given, originally given by Jesus, and we try to find places where it fits within the larger ecosystem of a community. And by the way, I see that not just in what we should be doing as churches today. This is faithful to how the early Christians in the scriptures did church as well. We see this in the story of Paul. Now, in this story today, Paul's on a mission trip. He, he takes three large trips, long trips, through the Roman Empire, visiting different places along the way. We get to um, read about the, trip, the trips themselves in the book of Acts, but we also see them in, in the letters of Paul as he's traveling around and, and founding new churches. And he comes to this place. Uh, he comes to Athens. Now, Athens, along with another city called Alexandria, was the... Um, philosophical capital of the Roman Empire. It was an intellectual place. It's where people talked about philosophy and new ideas. 
talked religion. And it was this philosophical mecca and this bit place where there was a big exchange every day of ideas. And so Paul comes to this place called Mars Hill, which was a marketplace, but more than just a market, it was a marketplace of ideas. And he looks around and he sees statues to all of the different gods and goddesses of, of the Greek uh, pantheon and, and the Roman pantheon. And we have to remember, Paul is a trained expert in, in Jewish thinking and teaching. Do you know what Paul was before he was a traveling Christian evangelist? He was a Pharisee. He was trained in Jewish tradition. He knew all about it. And, and Paul would not have, even, even though he was, he would not have had to have been an expert to know that all of these idols were, uh, what's the second commandment? Yes, thou shalt not have other gods, right? And Exodus 20 goes on to say, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them and worship them. So what I think is interesting is Paul comes to this focal point of worship that, that any nice Jewish kid would not have liked, would, would have found problematic. And what Paul doesn't do is he doesn't start by condemning these people or tearing down the idols or, or you know, wanting to go all holier than thou on these people. The very fact that he's there makes him different from a lot of Jewish and Jewish Christian rabbis of his time who wouldn't have wanted to be around people who are ritually unclean. And yet that's exactly where Paul goes and engages in the discussion. So he's true to his tradition. He knows where he came from. He's faithful to to the faith tradition that, that he was brought up in. But he starts the conversation where the average everyday Greek person would understand it. Without judgment, without condemnation, he says to them, I can see that you're very religious people. I can see that you're people who the truth is important to you. And that's had me thinking all week. That, that it's interesting to me that this is how Paul starts the conversation with the Romans. Not just because I knew I would be preaching on this today, although I did. It's been interesting to me because of what I've seen in the news this week. Because it occurs to me that we saw this in, in, in a really beautiful way, this same sort of dynamic, where someone went beyond the church guardrails to meet people exactly where they are. And, and it made headlines around the world because... At the Rome Film Festival, a documentary aired. And I, uh, not a lot of people have actually seen the documentary yet, but a lot of people are talking about a one-minute clip from it where Pope Francis is speaking um, about the LGBT communi LGBTQ community. And where he says, quote, homosexual people have the right to be in a family. They are children of God. Now, let's not overstate what happened in that statement. Uh, Catholic teaching did not change. They, they, the Catholic Church still does not support gay marriage. Um, I, I, I think they'll get there someday. But what I see here is that Pope Francis took something good from his own tradition. He took the concept of family. Now, family is important to a lot of us, and in Catholic theology, family is very, very important. And he, he took that and met people out in the world and said, you know what, I think gay and lesbian and transgender people have a right to be a part of a family, too. And that's a great thing. He said, without condemnation, that, of course, family, which shapes people's lives and their faith and their values, is a place that everybody should belong. Family is something that gay and lesbian people, no less than straight people, should be welcomed to, and that that should be celebrated and not condemned. And I think Paul would be proud of that. He would be proud of that kind of engagement, which took a little courage, because there are a lot of Catholics today who are not very happy with Pope Francis, people who are allies of his, and they are speaking out against him today. And what I think I saw in it is that the Pope wanted to engage the, lo the, glo the community, the global community, right where it is where gay and lesbian and transgender people are becoming more and more accepted and loved by others. And so let's take that same idea and bring it down to our own little corner of the forest. Because whether it's Paul 
or a modern pope, or whether it's Jesus, who let's remember, Jesus' mission was to come down and be in community with us. What's happening is that, we, is that we are being called to collaborate with our community, where we're not just being charged to go bring Jesus out to people so we can dole it out like it's a prize, but we're going out to try to find where Christ is already at work out in our community, and our job then is just to connect to that and be a part of what Jesus is already doing out in the world. So enough of me talking, because as I said, this is supposed to be collaborative. Uh, let's get the conversation started. I'm going to put my mask on for just one moment so I can come and, and get the program started. And as I do so, I want to invite you to go to that menti.com website if you're watching at home or online and enter the code 5965. 418. We'll give everyone just a moment to get on there. And what's exciting is if you're watching this live and you complete this survey, your answers, we're going to be able to see it in real time. Now, if you watch a recording of it, we still want you to be a part of the survey. Go ahead and complete it. But just know that, the, of course, the answers that we share are not going to be included. We will eventually compile everybody's answers. Everybody who completes this will be fill, it, you'll fill it out, um, and we'll, uh, we'll analyze the results. I'm going to do it, too. Let me turn my phone off. Yes, yeah, so that code is 5965418. Yeah. And um, as we start, there are just two rules that I ask you to follow. First of all, yes, you could speed through this survey and complete it in about two minutes' time. But um, especially if you're watching live or if you're here in the room, it's, it's better if you just go with us step by step. Um, and and uh, we'll go through it question by question. Um, and second, take this with your community in mind. Whatever you think of as your community, your friends, the people that you, that you hang out with, your neighbors, um, people who work for organizations and community agencies that you really agree with or believe in, people that go to other churches. It's not just a conversation about us. And um, you'll see that as we go through it. Um, last but not least, I'll say, if you're someone who watches our worship webcast, uh, but you have never been to church at Mesa View in person before, we really want your responses too. So please continue to do the survey because we're trying to find ways to be church to people um, no matter whether they uh, ever darken our doors or not. And so your perspectives are particularly valuable to us. So the first question is really just a test question. You can see these are the answers from um, 8.30 so far. But um, go ahead and complete the test question. Which dinosaur is the coolest? Now, um, your options are Iguanodon, which is definitely the most boring of all dinosaurs. Everybody knows that. Or the Pterodactyl, which I've always found the silent P um, somewhat uh, untrustworthy. Or the obvious right answer, Triceratops. So if you are um, watching uh, or you're here in the room, go ahead and vote just on the first test question. There's a surge for uh, pterodactyl, which I, like I just tell you right now, if pterodactyl overtakes, then next week's sermon is about why Triceratops is the best dinosaur. So you may just want to vote Triceratops. Okay, let's go to the next question. This, this just test questions here. Got a few more people coming in. In what, uh, also a test question. In what city do you currently live? Now, mostly that's going to be Albuquerque and Rio Rancho. I understand that. But go ahead and type in the answer. We know that there are some people who don't live in either of these two communities who still um, are, are tuning in, especially watching the worship webcast. We know there are some people who are watching in Texas and in um, Georgia and South Carolina, of all places, um, who have mostly had previous connections to this church or some of you. But go ahead and let us know where you live. Sure enough, mostly still Albuquerque and Rio Rancho. 
So now we're going to get into some of the meatier questions. How are you currently attending worship? And we know some of the people watching online are taking the survey because four of them have voted so far. I expect that number will go up as people watch the recordings on YouTube and elsewhere uh, while, we're, while we're watching today. Mostly going to be in person worship right now. I'm going to give just a little longer to answer that, but we're about 23. That's all right. That's pretty good. 24, another online worshiper. All right, let's go on to the next question. How long have you been connected to Mesa View? This can be, this is not when did you join the church, because not everybody has joined the church that we want in on this conversation. Uh, this can be, this is probably when did you start coming to some kind of worship event, be it online, be it here in church, uh, be it the Christmas party um, at uh, Taylor Ranch Park, at, uh, at the uh, park just across the street. And so a lot of people are 10 years or more, but not everybody. A lot of people, the second highest group are one to two years. Fairly new. I hear a lot of folks say, you know, we want to grow our church and we're worried about that. But I, I want you to see that um, there, there are a fair number of people who have started coming fairly recently. All right, next, next slide. Now, before you start answering this one, here, we miss, this was a little misleading in the first service. Um, I know that most of these you'll, you would want to answer a, a full five. Um, try to spread out your answers a little bit. The question is, how strongly do you feel that the following activities are important to the church's mission? All of them are, that's why they're there. But try to, just for our sake, pick out, and there are going to be six in all. You'll, you will see the next three in the next slide. But try to pick out some that would be threes or four. That doesn't mean you don't care about them. That just means that the ones you rate as fives are your top priorities, okay? So, yes, Mark. Yeah, so on the paper it goes from one to ten, but same, same thing. Just rate it within that, yeah. If you say a 10, I'll put it as a 5 into the computer. I'll, I'll uh, have whatever, whatever you write down on the paper. And by the way, there are some paper versions of this, and, and you can take it um, uh, on, on your way out um, if, if you don't have that paper version. And so these are the first three, and you can see um, Nurturing, the top one right now is reaching out to marginalized people. Second one is nurturing children and youth and young adults as they grow in faith. And of course we want to take Jesus to new places, but like I said, we got we to gotta prioritize, right? Let's see the next three. Cultivate places where people can learn and grow in their faith. That means small groups and youth group and Sunday school classes. Um, support and care during... Uh, for people during difficult times in life, if you've gone through a hard time and you've felt the love of a church, you know that that can be very important. And finally, to serve the community in ongoing and impactful ways, that we serve the poor and the homeless and, and people um, out beyond just our walls. So take a moment to complete those. Up to 19 responses, 20. All right. So next slide. All right. I want you to think about Mesa View. What are the things, the values, the traditions, the things that are already here that you feel are important? And you can actually, it, I think it gives you space for three entries, but you can do three entries and then do three more. You can add as many as you want, in other words. And as they appear in this word cloud, as, as you complete it, you're going to notice that some words will be pretty small, but others get bigger. Um, that means 
that uh, more people have, depending on the size of the word, that means more people have written the same thing. And you can write the same things that other people have written. So some that are uh, standing out are acceptance, love, choir, community, desire to serve, inclusion, compassion for others, potlucks. I, that was probably mine. Uh, prayer ministry. But you're starting to see that some words really start to stick out, right? These are the things that are already part of our DNA. And w just like Paul, when he brings his own tradition into the conversation, these are what we bring into the conversation with the community. Ministry, food pantry, caring, friendly, helping the homeless, compassion for others. Good responses, all of them. Music. I think we all agreed in the first service we miss choir. Uh, we miss uh, being able to sing together. All right, last chance. All right, we're off to a good start. Let's just pause for one moment because... Um, the next step is to go a little bit beyond our comfort zone, to go a little bit beyond just us and Mesa View, and that's it. Um, because let's pull up the next slide. What, what does our mission statement say? Mesa View United Methodist Church is called to know and love God through relationship, service, and witness. Uh, any organization, not just a church, your mission is what you're called to do, not internally, but to go out into the world and, and do. If, if we were the army and all of our goals and our mission were internal to make sure supply lines are good and the training's good, like those are nice things and they're important and, and you'd want that. But the army's job is to go out and conquer the world, right? Well, we're not exactly the army. The Christian mission's a little bit different than that. But we are called to go out into the world um, and, and that's what our mission is focused on. So these next questions have to do with how we relate to others. Uh, same thing with Paul. The Athenian marketplace that Paul went to, that's what we want to be thinking of also, is where are the places out in the world where we encounter others, both as individuals and also as a community? And so let's see the next slide, which I think has our next question. So we're going to talk about relationship, service, and witness, because those are our mission. With whom are we called to be in relationship? And what we got from the first service, um, for our church in particular, the community, God, neighbors, Suriname, LGBT community, homeless, the west side, the underprivileged, kids, family promise, Whatever you believe, whoever you believe we are called to be in relationship with as a church, that's our mission. Go ahead and write those responses. And same thing, you can put in three, and you could actually do three and then three more, as many as you want. Let's see what people add as we, as we go along. The world, wherever we are. Jesus, hope we're, I hope we're pursuing a relationship with Jesus, absolutely. The world, families. New Mexico, Suriname again. Up to 35 responses, that's great. I, that tells me that y'all are putting a lot of thought into this. Neighborhood focused, the unchurched, co-workers, one another, I like that. All right, let's go to the next one. We'll still be getting a few answers, that's okay. Where and who are we called to serve? Now, serve means where are we called to be, not just in relationship, but going a step further, partnering and serving in our community. And by the way, our community can mean the local neighborhood. It could mean Albuquerque, New Mexico. It could be the west side. It could be the world. It could be particular communities or organizations that we believe in. But where and who are we called to serve? Homeless, God, everyone, wherever we are, marginalized, the poor.
those we touch, hungry families. the world, those in need. I like that someone put outside our walls, because this is where most of this takes place, right? We, we, I'm happy anytime someone new walks through these doors or connects uh, to the church in some new way. Prisons. Prisons is new on the board. Hungry families. Friends. Taylor Ranch. West Side, the world, minorities. Heifer International. I'm glad. So, I, I wonder if uh, Bud Bechtel's watching this, but whoever put Heifer International, thank you for adding that. We'll take just one more second for any last minute additions. And as we do, just know if you're watching this as a recording, we'll, we'll show all of these slides. These will all go up at the end of the week on our Facebook page so you can see what others put um, in their entirety. I know a lot of the people that watch the webcast, uh, they'll watch it Sunday afternoon or maybe Monday, and so we'll, we'll keep collecting answers through the week. Let's go on to the next survey. Good. In what, play, uh, in what, place, in what ways, places, or communities can we be a great, greater witness to our faith? So we've gone from relationship to service. Now we're talking witness. Where are we called to share our faith. And for this, let me get really, ask you to think really uh, specific. Of, um, are, is there an organization that you believe in? Is there a place where you think we could make a difference? If, if you think, you know, I'm, I'm just spitballing, if you think we could start a soccer league at the local park, great. Uh, whatever it is, where are we called to be a greater witness to our faith? Outdoor services, covenant group, prison again, poor, food banks, by living our faith, BLM, Black Lives Matter, in our small groups, by accepting differences, helping people in need, again, LGBTQ. Suriname Prison and BLM seem to be uh, trending a little bit. Christmas. Since I see it up there, I'll just tell you our, our plan for Christmas Eve. It's going to be an outdoor service um, out in the parking lot so that guests can come and um, not have to worry and, and be comfortable as they worship with their families on Christmas. And uh, we will be having the community Christmas celebration in that way. See if I'm if anything news come in before we move on to the next one. Sunday school, at our job. Yes, thank you. Acceptance of everyone by attending church. The doors on the street. Good. Yeah. So you can see, lots of you. All of a sudden, this is looking less and less like the right flyer, and more and more like a little bit of a jumbo jet. Um, which is what we're, we're aiming for. Or at least maybe, you know, we're not a huge church. Maybe we're going for like a Cessna or something. But better than the right flyer. Let's go on to the next slide because um, let's pause for just one more moment. And now let's try to get more specific still. I want you to think about our church's future. I want you to think about five years from now. And as you dream about what our church might look like five years from now, what does it look like? Now, that can be a very general question. Uh, you know, I expect some people will say bigger or, you know, with a deeper faith or, or um, it, you know, lots of things in, in the broad spectrum. But you might be thinking, I hope five years from now we have this and such kind of ministry that's very new and innovative or, or very exact. So let's bring up the next question. What do you hope Mesa View UMC looks like five years from now? And these are going to, you'll see them scrolling as, um, as they go along. A prayer garden, 
larger music department, larger youth program, Sunday school classes. I'm going to go as fast as I can, but I know most of you can also watch this as it goes. Um, distribute literature, literature that's inclusive of LGBTQ communities. Continuing being a reconciliation church, try to increase youth program, renew our women's program, Ventana Ranch extension, youth ministry, a park for all, strong children in youth ministry. I'm seeing a theme there. Um, choir that once again can bring worship and music and praise to worship. Larger youth program. Suriname and Family Promise. Help grow ministries like Suriname. There's another theme, which is good because they're going to be right next door pretty quick here. Gospel music. Amen. More community outreach, growing our congregation. Community classes, coffee house ministry, basketball courts. Basketball courts. I love I would never what I love is I would never have thought that, but I think that's a great idea. That's why that's why I'm glad we're having these conversations. Spreading the uh, goodness of God. More children, active LGBT ministry, more food. Trying VBS, Suriname. Outreaches to small communities. Up to about 25, so I'm going to give it just a few, a little bit longer. 26. I want to see what number 26 is. Church outreach for needy growth in numbers with the same welcoming congregation. Twenty-eight responses. That's great. And then there's just one more question, and it is, "What's your name?" Because I I do want to know who's completed it and who I need to uh, call and harass as we as we try to collect responses. So just go ahead and enter your name. We actually won't show this part publicly except here on the webcast. And you're done, and that was pretty simple. Now let me tell you where we go from here, because this conversation doesn't end today. This is, this is just like the first opening salvo of this conversation, and so we're going to do a few other things along the way, too. Uh, first of all, we're going to um, try to have a lot of these conversations a lot more in-depth through uh, Zoom meetings that you'll be um, invited to um, on different issue areas where that, that stood out in this first conversation. But of course, we don't want to just have this conversation with us internally. Um, and so we're seeking out uh, conversations and, and times to discuss the future with the Neighborhood Association, with um, local organizations like Family Promise, with uh, organizations like uh, PFLAG, um, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, um, with uh, people in the neighborhood and beyond just the local neighborhood. And so this will continue for the next several weeks to where we hope by January we're ready to really start diving in. But all of this stems from a simple idea, and it was Paul's idea too, that the church was an important place and the church, the church is an important place in our culture and our world. You know, sometimes I talk with church folks and we have a real inferiority conflict uh, uh, complex in the church where a lot of times we're, we're pretty quick to figure out that, you know, we're not perfect here and church can be um, off-putting sometimes. But we really ought to be proud of who we are. Um, we really ought to be proud and not defensive about who the church is. Because, you know, I, I've worked in the church a long time. I've seen the ugliness. But I've also seen such beauty and, and, and the ways that churches change communities and individuals. And in the end, the church changes the world. So I'm looking forward to hearing more and more. Let me just see um, who uh, was watching uh, doing this. Uh, so from here, uh, we got Carrie, we got Christy, Stephanie Johnston, Kent, um, and other. And we'll, we'll, I'm sure names will continue to come in. Um, but as we close today, will, will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, for this day, we give you thanks. 
And we pray that you would send your spirit blowing across this con congregation. We pray that you would give us inspiration, that you would give us energy and, and enthusiasm for, for this mission. We, we love this church. We're here because we love this place. Um, and we're here because we love you and we love the way that we have encountered you in this church. So be with us as we continue this conversation and walk with us and give us insight. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. I wanted to say one thing as I close. I told you as we started this uh, series that um, a big part of this was I, I would share each week some fresh expressions, some different ideas of how people are being church out beyond the world. We went um, and looked at a coffee house church and, and a church that was all homeless people, um, one that was doing partnerships with schools and one that was serving a campus community. Um, and we have uh, someone that was going to share today and she got called away, but the last fresh expression I wanted to share was one from our congregation. Um, and so I'll just share on her behalf, Deb Humiston has a vision for um, something new at Mesa View. And um, when she shared it with me, I was really excited because let me tell you about my life uh, for about the, six or, uh, about the last six or seven months. Um, I have about eight recipes that I know how to cook, and they're good. I, I, I'm an okay cook as far as people go. Uh, but when the pandemic hit, I cooked those eight recipes pretty quickly. And then I thought, well, what do I do now? Well, I guess I'll start um, with number one again and go back through eight more times. You know, and uh, I've been doing this for eight months now, six or seven or eight months now. Um, Deb wants to eventually, when the pandemic is over, have a group where people come together and they learn to cook. We have members from different countries that go to this church and who've traveled the world. Um, B. Chamcharatsri, I know uh, you're watching and I'm looking at you, man. You're, you're gonna teach us how to cook Thai food in this group. Um, Aaron Hill, you're gonna teach us how to cook something from Taiwan. And uh, Josie Hernandez has been, I think, everywhere in the world. And, um, and whether it's something exotic from a faraway place, or we're gonna start out and Deb is gonna teach us how to make biscuits of all things. We're also not going to wait until the end of the pandemic because Deb is going to start um, putting uh, an online version of this up with, with the help of some of our technical team. And so if you're a cook and you want to share online so that the poor families of Taylor Ranch um, and beyond who um, maybe are looking for some new things to cook right now, um, we want this to be something where it reaches out in a new way uh, from our church. And I'm excited to see uh, what it turns into. If you want to learn more about it, just go ahead and contact Deb Humiston, and she's very enthusiastic about it. But for now, as we get ready to close, first of all, let me say that um, we're going to do our closing song indoors today because it's a little breezy and we don't have all the equipment we needed. Um, but uh, so we'll have our closing song, and then as you exit, if you would like to, you can um, put your offering in the gray box. And if you're watching online, you know the you know the deal. Go, go to MesaViewMC.com, click giving. But for now. I've talked for a very long time, and they've been doing their best to pay attention, and they've done great with that, but um, I think it's time for someone else to uh, take over and lead us in worship today. As they say in scouting, a song, a song, it's time to sing a song. Exactly. Okay. You can stand up if you want. You are good, you are good, when there's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my
my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no As we go forth from this place, go forth in peace, but go forth to bring peace to others. What happens in here is important, but where it gets really critical is when we bring it out into the world. So go forth in that message and in that spirit. Amen. Go outside these doors and be the church.